Hello, and welcome to the AAMFT Podcast, your all-access pass to the latest news developments and thought leaders in the world of systemic therapy. We strive to relate, educate, and innovate one episode at a time. I'm your host, Dr. Eli Karam, and we're brought to you by the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy. Our podcast explores topics that relationship-based therapists care about. In addition to featuring unique conversations and interviews with established experts, our show provides information and education on direct practice and emerging trends in the MFT profession. For more information, please visit us at aamft.org. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. It's today on the AAMFT podcast, let's talk about sex. And that's a topic practicing MFTs need to know about. And who better to talk about that with than uh, a pioneer in the field, an integrator of MFT and sex therapy. I'm talking about Dr. David Snarch. For 17 years, he was an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Urology at Louisiana State Medical School before becoming the co-director of the Crucible Institute, a.k.a. the Marriage and Family Health Center in Evergreen, Colorado, with his wife, Ruth Morehouse. David is a certified sex therapist by the American Association of Sex Educators, also known as ASEC, and he received their first-ever Professional Standard of Excellence Award. He's also a clinical fellow right here with the AAMFT and was honored in 2011 with the Distinguished Contribution to Marriage and Family Therapy Award. He served on the editorial board of JMFT, but most of you know him from his 1991 book, The Groundbreaking Constructing the Sexual Crucible, an Integration of Sexual and Marital Therapy. And this crucible therapy is still used in training programs across the country today and read by therapists worldwide. He's been very popular with the couple market and consumers as well with his book, Passionate Marriage. That was back in 1997, followed up by Resurrecting Sex in 2002 and 2009's Intimacy and Desire. Those books have been published in seven languages and have become international bestsellers. David's latest book released last year in 2018 is Brain Talk, which explores the hidden world of interpersonal neurobiology via mind mapping. What's mind mapping, you ask? That's the brain's innate ability to make mental maps of other people's minds. Uh, Brain Talk gives the general public and mental health professionals alike access to the crucible neurobiological therapy. And that is uh, his model developed through 15 years of clinical research with highly troubled clients. And you'll hear him very outspoken on uh, where he thinks the fields of sex therapy and marital therapy are going. Uh, in addition to some great stories, including his early relationship with William Masters. You'll hear him talk about what he thinks about Murray Bowen and what Murray Bowen would have thought about his work. And a lot of questions. If uh, how, do you, how do you yourself, if you do not have the best intimate or sexual relationship, how do you help couples uh, to have theirs? After the interview, I'll be back. Preview what's coming up on future installments of the AMFT podcast. Sit back, enjoy Dr. David Snarch. All right, I am pleased to be joined by Dr. David Snarch here on the interview of the AAMFT podcast. Now, I've been excited to talk to you for a while, David, because you're very open uh, talking about not only your model, but your own self of therapist. So today, this will probably be uh, maybe ask some questions that you've never been asked before. But the first one is always, I ask people, how did you get interested in the field of psychotherapy, specifically couples? I started out in the field of sex therapy, and this was back in the 1960s. And um, this was when sex therapy and MFT, I think, were really getting started. It was sort of the heyday. And it was amazing to me that you could be certified as a sex therapist with no training in marriage and family therapy. And then it amazed me that you could be certified as a marriage and family therapist with no training in sex therapy. 
So I decided I would do both. So I really came out of the sex field, and uh, I knew Bill Masters. We spent time with him. Uh, <clears throat> and then I started moving over to working more in, in couples therapy and decided to be dual certified. So I was one of the first dual certified therapists in both fields. It still amazes me that someone can be certified as a sex therapist with really no training about marriage and family therapy and vice versa. But why do you think that is? Those, those fields, uh, we hear this is obviously the AAMFT podcast, but ASECT is a, obviously a very popular organization. Sure. And you don't see that many duly certified people. Why do you think that is? Because there's a delusion in both fields that you can take the expertise from one field and generate it to the other without any specialty training. This is still a tremendous problem in the field today. Increasingly, MFTs seem to feel that they have the resources or at least, least access to the turf of sex therapy without any training. And if you take a look at the leaders in the MFT field who are now working in the area of sex, you won't find any specialty training in sex, which really concerns me. But I had the same concerns about sex therapists, thinking that they could generalize their skills. I think one of the reasons that is, is because both fields pride themselves, unfortunately, on what's called a systemic approach. And in the 1970s, sex therapy stalled for about 10 years because people thought that if you just applied a, a systemic concepts, you now had a systemic therapy. And it really took about 30 years for sex therapy to develop a truly systemic approach. And I think the same thing's true in the field of marriage and family therapy today. There are overlap. The original overlap was that both fields gave homework. And because both fields gave homework, people thought that you could just merge the two. And that's unfortunately not, too, be, not true because what it does is it sort of gathers together the incongruence of both fields. But because there are superficial similarities, people think they can go ahead and do the job until it doesn't work. And that, I think, has been the history of both fields crossing An over. Another similarity would be that both fields in the heyday, as, as you started in the 60s and early 70s of both sex therapy, uh, with Masters and Johnson and your classic family therapy models were all behavioral based, uh, which led to um, what we call first order change, but not necessarily a second order change. So I think of you as this integrationist between uh, couple therapy and sex therapy, but also kind of expanding the frame out of this traditional behavioral based Masters and Johnson sex therapy. You said you worked with Masters. Tell us what that was like. Uh, well, most people don't know that Bill Masters was never trained as a therapist. He was trained as an OBGYN, and he was one of the first OBGYNs to really be interested in sex. His mentors had to protect him from blowing up his career when he became an OBGYN because then Bill had to get the chairman of the OBGYN department to go to the library with him and check out the plates from Gray's Anatomy for pictures of vaginas. Now, he's seeing this stuff all day long, but this is how provincial it was. And so Bill had learned a little bit about Wolfie's work in Behavior Mod and thought that he could just sort of port it in. But unfortunately, Bill built a, uh, a, an intimacy incongruent model, the very thing he didn't want to do because what he wanted to build was what most MFTs want to build, which is what you think is a sex positive approach. But unfortunately, once you build an approach that takes no good sexual functioning as the norm and then looks at everything as dysfunctional, you have built an inherently dysfunctional approach. And I remember talking to Bill about that. And he was intellectually honest. He said, boy, Dave, that was really not my intent. And I think that's what happens to many therapists. You build a model that carries your intent, but you never work it backwards as to how is this thing going to run into problems. So crucible therapy was the first ground-up integration of both sex and couples therapy that actually disagreed with the basic tenets in both fields. So it's not as simple as putting approaches together. Yeah, I'm going to ask you how you kind of... Uh, 
came up with the crucible approach in a second. But also, people can't think of your model without thinking of the word differentiation. And when we think of differentiation, we think of Murray Bowen and Bowenian family therapy. When's the first time you ever heard or came across Murray Bowen? Oh, that was after I moved into the field. I knew I wanted to uh, do more marriage and family therapy, but when I saw Bowen's work on differentiation, I was amazed at the elegance of it. It was different than things that are, were around at the time, and he was really onto something. But see, that's the other thing uh, about Murray Bowen. Murray Bowen never applied his work to sex. He just applied it to marriage. And so Crucible was the first time somebody had taken differentiation theory and applied it to sex, and it was completely different than what was going on in marriage and family therapy. Because at that point, marriage and family therapy was porting an idea of intimacy that basically was the idea that one person was supposed to disclose and the other person was supposed to accept or validate or disclose in kind. This was the early work of uh, David Mace. This was the early work of uh, the people in the field. And unfortunately, what we realized was that built gridlock right into the problem. So the methods that were being used to treat sexual problems were actually the same solutions that couples were coming to spontaneously that didn't work. Once you were dependent on your partner's reciprocity, number one, it kills intimacy. Number two, it increases dependency. And nobody wants to have sex with somebody that you're constantly validating all the time. Right, you're exhausted, right. You want someone who can stand on their own two feet. Now, now did that come, obviously, you were turned on by the, the theory of differentiation, but yeah. what, what you were saying, did that come from your direct work with couples, or how, how did you come up with the crucible approach? Uh, failure is a great teacher. And I started off working with Bill Masters failures. So when people would go to see him, things would not work, then they would come to me, and you can't do the same therapy that doesn't work twice. People do not want to pay for that. So that's what forced us to come up with new methods because we were treating the treatment failures. So I published several papers around what it was like to start, and I remember somebody coming to me, a couple coming to me, and they had already bounced out of Masters and Johnson therapy, and the wife looked at me, and, she said, are you, are you going to make me do sensate focus? She said, why not? I said, because I'm not a good therapist. She said, well, that's good. I'm not a good client. And that was the beginning of going down a road where it was really much more learning as we went about what didn't work and trying out the things that we were taught to do, uh, like sensate focus, put a ban on intercourse, People do not like being told what they're supposed to do and not do with their spouses, and it takes on all the power dynamics. If you're dealing with same-sex couples, it becomes a real problem. People still do not want to be told what to do, even if you're of the same gender. And so that's how we started using a differentiation-based approach, which is almost counterintuitive when you get to sex, because most of the things that people think are supposed to make sex good kill sex. But the, the idea that normality, not pathology, is one of the major problems for couples was a real revolution. The idea that sexual problems are not a sign that something's going wrong in a relationship, quite the contrary. Sexual problems are predictable. Normal couples have sexual problems. And that was a real revolution because when you're working on a basically pathological model that assumes sexual function is a given, and if you're not interested, you have a desire problem or you have a sexual dysfunction, the immediate presumption on both the couple's part and the therapist's part is something's going wrong. And guess what? When couples understand that's how you see things, they don't want to tell you anything because they think they're look you're looking for their inadequacies or what's wrong with them. And going in and presenting just a completely different zeitgeist, not by lecturing, but just by talking to people, they figure out you, when people will come in and say, can you fix my marriage? And you say, well, I can't because there's nothing wrong with it. You may have operator error, but there's nothing basically wrong with your marriage. Sex goes the way it goes when you handle it the way that you do. Adopting a completely different view about how sex is supposed to go and what's involved, including the importance of 
uh, when you're dependent on your partner's validation, you're going to have the worst sex going. And so when you get to the point that your marriage sucks and your, ma and your partner won't, all of a sudden people think it's time to get divorced as opposed to time to change your ideas because normal people have sexual problems. Tell us some of the most important lessons early on you learned from these clients uh, about what to do and what not to do that shaped the model. Uh, number one, you don't give people homework assignments because it makes it easy for people to just defeat you when you say, I, I want you to do that, and they say no. Taking the role of uh, an advisor but not an authority on other people's sex is really hard to do because it means you got to know something but not everything. Uh, realizing that most people have sexual desire problems, it's almost a natural evolution for poorly differentiated people. So beginning to see that there is a pattern, a, a reliable uh, uh, sequence that people go through where sex is great at the beginning and then all of a sudden it gets boring because when you're dependent on your partner's validation, you're not going to show them anything new. And it turns out that sex is one of the first things that establishes the rules about what's going to happen in the relationship. Before you get to talking about money, kids, in-laws, where you're going to live, who's going to have what job, you're usually laying down the sexual dynamics, and uh, particularly where, uh, at least in the United States, uh, women tend to minimize their sex. Very often we found that they were building themselves into a problem. They look like the low desire partner, but they often knew more about sex, like sex more, and had more sex than their male counterparts, but they had started out being basically dependent on their partner's validation, thought that they should lowball this thing, and the guy strutting around like he's cock of the rock because he thinks that's the role of men in sex. You put these are, by the way, this is normal. This is not pathological. This is the way that people adapt to society. The idea that normality is the problem is a real issue for a lot of couples, it makes them relax, but then it also raises an issue for a therapist. Well, if it's normal and it's not pathological, how do you fix it? And that's what you learn not to do. You know, this idea of differentiation, it speaks to many therapists. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's this universal language that, that Bowen used. How do you explain that to clients? without using jargon, without saying the word, uh, how do you frame that in the, in the beginning of the work? Uh, I don't. Uh, I think if you start lecturing people about differentiation, uh, n number one, people shift gears. They start doing left brain thinking. They start thinking about deductive logic. And there are too many people who talk ideas, but they don't do good therapy, just like there are people who talk ideas that are not very good in bed as well. For, so, for instance, talking practically, like uh, working with a couple and uh, uh, let's say the woman is the lower desire partner, uh, the idea uh, uh, of saying to her, uh, you know, she, she, uh, she says, I don't like sex. And it's so much easier to say, I don't like sex, as opposed to, I love sex. I don't like sex with you. Once you can get to that point, which a lot of couples do not want to get to, then the next question is, why not? And the answer is very often, uh, because you keep telling me to tell you how good you are in bed, or to validate you, or you're the best I ever had, or all the rest of this stuff. When you're dependent on your partner's validation, nobody's interested. So being able to say to a woman, you know, I've worked with a lot of women, and you know what some of them tell me? They turn to their husbands and they say, I'll inflate your ego or I'll inflate your penis, but I'll be damned if I'm doing both. Take your pick. And so functioning on that level, all of a sudden, the woman relaxes. She talks more openly. She realizes you're not going to put her into a box. And getting away from the idea that the lower desire partner is inherently pathological. That was the way things started out because, remember, sex was a natural function. That was Bill's model. But once you do sex as a natural function, you've built an inherently pathological model to explain why everybody else isn't just having natural function. Talking about desire not as a biological drive the way that uh, 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 Helen Singer Kaplan did, Talking about desire as a human capacity, 
no longer talking about desire as desire for sex and talking about it as desire for your partner completely changes the game and realizing that since you never get a guarantee that your desires are going to be fulfilled, then differentiation very quickly is easy to integrate with desire. Because if you're going to have desire, you got to be able to take care of your own feelings. You got to be able to take care of your own disappointments. Um, desire means that uh, if you're only dependent on what your partner is going to suggest, you're going to have really terrible sex. And so that's what people start out with. They start out with trying to find somebody who wants to do what they want to do, doesn't do what they want to do. It sounds great at the beginning. Five years later, nobody wants to have sex anymore because that sexual boredom is built into relationships that way. Somebody's got to say, I'd like to do this. And the other person's going to say, that's a disgusting, perverted thing to do because that's what you always say when somebody proposes something beyond your level of sexual development. And differentiation is learning that when your partner is trying to contain you by saying, that's terrible, that's disgusting, why do you want to do that? You have to learn to say, it is disgusting, that's why I want yeah, to do it. You have to have it. You have to be able to validate yeah, it. you have to validate that. And I'm curious what you think as far as training an integrated uh, MFT slash sex therapist, what do you think are essential qualities that anyone is going to do this work, what they have to have as far as self of therapist qualities? Oh, I think, uh, number one, a little uh, relationship experience helps. Uh, two helpings of lousy sex, I think, is something that every therapist should have so that they aren't so sanguine about other people's lack of sex. And I think trying to change it because the whole idea that the therapist is going to come up with an idea and both people are snapped to and go, oh, yeah, you know, if we had thought about that, we'd be doing that too. The point is they can read Joy of Sex just like a therapist can. So what it really involves much more is engaging people in the idea that sex is developmental. It's not a collection of skills. It's a collection of meanings. And most of us, when we're young, we learn one meaning. Sex means I love you, right? Teaching people sex is used to express every human emotion, positive and negative, that humans are capable for, begins to help therapists understand that you don't just tell people you try this or try that because almost invariably you're taking them beyond their developmental level. And when you do that, they're not going to do it. That's when you, quote, get resistance. So I think therapists in both fields need to understand about how sex is wired to your guts. It's wired to your level of development. And it's not do you do a repertoire of behaviors, it's a repertoire of meanings. And the difficulty is after a while, it doesn't make any difference whether you're doing missionary position, doggy style, swinging from the chandeliers, they all have the same meaning. And so helping couples expand their meaning frame as a therapist, that takes a lot of work. You're taking on their religious upbringing, you're taking their training, and you're taking on their level of development. And you know, Bowen once said that uh, a therapist could never get a couple or a client past their own level of differentiation. Do you believe that? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I swear by that. Uh, increasingly, we're doing training around the world, helping therapists uh, become better therapists, and you can't do that if you don't take on the person of the therapist. So there is nothing in MFT training or certification that says you and I are having better sex than the average person walking on the street. When you begin to realize that the only difference between therapists and the clients that they treat is that therapists went to school. They have all the same hang-ups. They have all the same problems. One of the things that I love about our approach is that the people who learn our approach walk the walk. They very often take these issues back into their uh, couples. They end up struggling with their partners. They end up facing the issues about they're afraid they're going to get divorced. They're afraid they're going to stay together, but sex is going to be as lousy as it is. If you haven't gone through that as a therapist, you have no business messing around in somebody yes. else's bedroom. Another thing that makes you interesting is you and your wife are not only a team in life, but a team professionally. So say a little bit. I'm curious even the origin story of that. I would like to know how you met Ruth and then how your own 
intimate life and your ebb and flow over the years has impacted not only your theory, but also your work with couples? Uh, one of the interesting things that when Ruth and I got together, I already had something of a, of a reputation, and Ruth was one of the premier local therapists in New Orleans. She was head of... Well, our timeline, what, what year are we at? Oh, uh, we're in 1970s, 1980s. Okay. And you, I, so you'd been doing the work for a decade. Yeah. Yeah. Ab- absolutely. But when, when I wrote Passionate Marriage, I think what people expected was this message that says... If you learn our approach like we developed our approach, you won't have any problems because we don't have any problems. And what we said was, we got the same problems everybody else, maybe we handle them better. But it's still that idea of sexual problems are built into emotionally committed relationships. And when I published Intimacy and Desire, I said, I've had every sexual problem a man could have, including you can't get it up, you can't get it down. And... and People at the beginning said, boy, that's really self-revealing. It's like, look, if you're going to talk like, you know, your penis stands up or your vagina gets wet on command every single time you have robotic type of functioning, nobody's going to want to talk to you because you have no idea what it's like to be a human being and deal with sexual issues. So in Passion and Marriage, we talked about getting to the point where I was certain Ruth and I were gonna break up. We were so far out in left field, I had never seen anybody come back farther than my clients. And being two therapists, you know, we had the embarrassment of everybody else and we really had to get on top of that. And so not taking a superordinate attitude, particularly when it comes to problems, um, I think helps clients talk to you. You seem like a human being. But increasingly, what we're seeing, particularly is, for instance, not just the sex work and the marital stuff, but doing the neurobiological stuff. I just came back from doing a training program uh, here in the United States two weeks ago. Four weeks ago, I was in Germany. We did the same workshop. Every single therapist attending the workshop came out recognizing they had a neurobiological problem. Therapists have huge blind spots. That's one of the interesting things that, that I think is really worth talking about. The general public understands that therapists have different approaches, but the general public looks at it like, well, we all see the same thing, we just decide to handle it differently. And what we've learned from training therapists for 30 years is the hardest thing is to get a therapist to be able to see what's right in front of them. And that's where these blind spots start showing up. And uh, it's, it's really sort of amazing. And if therapists are not going to deal with themselves on that level, um, you're not going to be a very good therapist. That, that's all I can say. Because being, for instance, for a therapist, uh, you, you, don't, you don't sit down with another therapist and say, you know, I, I haven't had sex in six months. How about you? Uh, but there are lots of ther- th- therapists, marital MFTs, they haven't had sex in a year. They're in celibate marriages. And when the therapist is embarrassed because of that, now you really have trouble. So we really emphasize the training uh, and the development of the person of the therapist, deciding what it's like to go back to your partner and say, I am not getting lucky ever again. All right, so let's talk about that. Let's say you are a therapist and you are doing the work with a couple, but you hit your own block or interface issue. It's an example you gave that uh, your own uh, intimate relationship is not going well. You're not having sex with your partner. How how do you train therapists then to get over that block in order to help other couples that are having a similar issue? Well, we don't immediately send them to another therapist. What we do is we ask them to practice what they want to preach. And so the whole issue of confronting your partner that uh, you know that they're avoiding you or you, how about this, you've come to a point in your marriage where you decide you don't want to have sex with your partner anymore, but do you tell your partner or do you just let this run out like a lot of couples do? That's the difference between somebody who's going to be a therapist and is going to sit down and say, we need to face this directly. I'm not happy about this, scares the hell out of me where this could go. But we have a lot of people who are willing to confront their spouse, not because they're invested in their marriage, but because they're invested in being a therapist. And so they're willing to go do the work because they really want to be the 
best therapist that they could be. But when it came to their marriage, they would let that go otherwise. Yeah. What is the most or what are the biggest things you've learned from being married to Ruth uh, as far as, you know, you've written about it in your book, but as far as shaping your development? Do not, <laughs> you do not tell your partner what to do with their body because uh, possession is still nine-tenths of the law. That, that's the thing to learn about giving suggestions to clients. It needs to be done much more gentle much less authoritarian, more like a suggestion. This might work for some people. I don't know about you. But, um, uh, and, and also expecting, expecting sex not to always go great, uh, expecting to have disagreements about it. It is where differentiation plays out. So even if you both like having sex the same number of days a week or month, the days a month, you like the same positions, it's going to polarize, and eventually it's going to be an issue of who likes sex in the morning, who likes sex in the night, and who died and made you God that you could decide when we're going to have sex. And so all the issues about being taken for granted, reflected sense of self, the lack of boundaries that come up, you won't find a place that it will come up stronger than sex. Maybe money will be second, in-laws will be third, right? But... It's a common thread that's weaved through everything, yes. Well, it, it, one of the things uh, about sex is you can't agree to disagree about whether you're having sex tonight. Or actually, you can. The high-desire partner says, let's have sex. The low-desire partner says, well, we can agree to disagree and acts like they're being egalitarian. Right? <laughs> when you're not, right? Because you're dealing with a monopoly. You ever do co-therapy with Ruth? Uh, no, uh, just before uh, uh, Ruth started learning the approach and doing the work, I work with a co-therapist, and uh, well, uh, that's another you know a hallmark of Master Johnson, Masters and Johnson double couple technique. And I, I wondered what your thoughts on co-therapy with we tried same, it yeah. and it's terrible. Number one, uh, both therapists want time to talk. Things, uh, priorities aside from dealing with the couple, because the first thing you don't do is you don't drop your alliance with your co-therapist. That takes time. And I remember uh, a couple looking at me and my co-therapist, and I had a good co-therapist. They looked at me. I had done something, and they said, oh, when you do this, that means that. And when she does this, and they're sitting there mapping us, and it just slows everything down. Uh, so, no, crucible therapy is done with a single therapist. And uh, if you can't talk to women uh, and you're male, then bringing in a female co-therapist is not going to solve the problem. And so they <clears throat> had, they did uh, same gender uh, interviews, then they did cross gender interviews. Then you got together and you had this sit down and you told them everything that you were going to do. It was so naive. It really was. Uh, I think it needs to be done much more strategically. But uh, <clears throat> we're, about ju we're just about to do a female therapist-only workshop on working with men. And this is where you get a chance, if you're a female therapist, to talk about things you never get to talk about in your AAMFT program, right? You can have a practicum in there. There's a limit to how far you go. You don't talk about the unfortunate experiences you've had developmentally working with the opposite gender. That doesn't come up. Uh, you usually don't get to talk about, how, how about this uh, as uh, a topic? The six things I've learned about the opposite gender by having sex with them, right? Uh, that's an interesting thing because most, uh, not most, but many women's pages would be completely blank because they're not supposed to have learned anything by having sex with other people. Guys are allowed to talk about what they might have learned, and that has to change. That's the kind of thing. What are you hoping out of that training? What are you hoping? What are the goals from a training uh, perspective like that, training uh, female clinicians to be more comfortable with men in the room, especially talking about sexuality? What are the other goals for uh, an intensive training like that? Oh, well, it, it completely changes the whole show because it's no longer about sex. When you are a male therapist and you can talk to uh, a, a woman well or you're female and you can handle a man in the session, 
the partner sits up and takes notice. Very often you're the first person who's ever been able to contain their spouse. And when they see that you can handle your spouse, their spouse, you're playing in a completely different game. When you can conduct a balanced session where both people are willing to un- uh, agree that you understand their position, in, in, in sex is different for men and women. Uh, uh, the, the upbringing is different. Women's body issues are very different than men's issues. Men's performance issues are different. But how you relate to a man with performance anxiety about erectile functioning when you're a woman and you're going to talk to him about that. A lot of young female therapists, they're so worried about the precious male ego. Conversation never comes up and they don't realize they're making the man nervous by treating him like he's got something to be embarrassed about and helping a woman get to the point that she can be straightforward talking about sexual dysfunctions and often it occurs sooner with somebody else's partner than your own partner. This idea of uh, gender specific training is interesting to me. Do you think about the reverse too, training male clinicians to talk to females about female sexuality? Uh, I'm curious what you think about that. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You think about all the feeling people just have about the opposite sex genitalia. So for instance, uh, there there are lots of women who are orgasmic to oral sex, but they don't have a partner who's willing to do it. And they ask, and that's what the therapist says, you know, ask for what you want. Therapists convey this bizarre idea that when you ask for what your partner, your partner's gonna go, you know what, I never thought of that since you suggested, let's go do that right now. And so, for instance, helping women deal with a male partner who has issues about female genitalia. And believe me, women are waiting for that. They're watching that man to turn up his nose or act like it doesn't smell good or something else. And just like guys are so worried about the size of their penis, if the woman just doesn't look like she's ready to just go down on them, then those are issues that are hard for therapists to deal with because we're not just dealing with uh, uh, about uh, indoctrination. Now you're dealing with people's feelings and their preferences for what they like and what they don't like. In helping couples deal with uh, the idea about sexual preferences, uh, a lot of people like to believe you're entitled to your sexual preferences and we like to say that's true until you get married because all of a sudden, People's preferences are not really what they like to do. It, the people's preferences are more what they're uncomfortable with, meaning they let the limits of their sexual development determine what their sexual repertoire is. And so a therapist going in, not trying to negotiate between the couple, but recognizing usually both people have to get outside their comfort zone. So for a while we did training and we did workshops with the idea of outside the comfort zone not what people are expecting when it comes to sex and not what people are expecting for marriage because there are many MFTs that have this idea that marriage is supposed to be some kind of safe haven that you go forth into the mean world. Uh, Nobody will be more of a source of anxiety to you than your spouse except for maybe your kids. So the idea of this safety and security in marriage, particularly when it comes to sex, wrong idea. Yeah, many people or most people can't grow without doing something a little out of their comfort zone. So part of what you do, as we were saying earlier, with this idea of instead of pathologizing sexual dysfunction, uh, kind of normalizing the ebb and flow of sexuality over the life course of a relationship, what are other things for tips for therapists starting to do this work as far as normalizing with couples? Because I think another appeal of your approach is, you know, much like MFT is based in a health premise and strengths focused uh, this is a model uh, and a way of working that, that taps into that. Uh, what, what other things do you normalize for couples? Uh, the idea that you're not going to be comfortable with everything. The idea that there's going to be sexual conflict. Uh, but sexual conflict isn't the problem. What couples are usually fighting over is whose limitations are going to control the sexual pattern. Otherwise known as, that makes me uncomfortable. But here's where uh, I I think in some ways sex is a good preparation for parenthood, not just for having good time, because once you have an adolescent, you can count on, you're not going to have all the answers. They're going to take you outside your comfort zone. That's what turns you into a parent. And so the whole idea 
of an anxiety tolerance approach. This was one of the big changes between Crucible and even MNJ. Masters and Johnson and most sex approaches are anxiety reduction approaches. Most MFT approaches are also anxiety reduction approaches. That's why they don't tend to work for sex. For sex, what it requires is anxiety tolerance. What it requires to deal with problems that come up in a marriage, to increase differentiation, to deal with kids who get Those are your four points of balance, right? That's, that's right. A clear sense of self, the ability to regulate your own anxiety, take care of your own feelings, the willingness to uh, tolerate discomfort for growth, and the ability to keep your reactivity down but still be able to kick your own butt and make yourself get up and do what you don't want and to To me, do. that is a beautiful oper- operationalization of differentiation, yeah. those four points of balance. Yeah. You mentioned I always ask people about their family of origin because we only know you know two relationships, that and the one we're in and our blueprint of what we came from our parents. So I'm yeah. curious, was your family of origin one where sex was open or was very closed off, and what did you learn from your parents and your family of origin that led you into this work? Um, I remember my dad blushing, but sitting down and giving me the talk, you know, so he did what he thought he was supposed to do. And um, uh, my parents weren't prudish, but they, they, they were sort of proper for the time. So, um, uh, I remember late in life, I had a conversation with uh, uh, my mother about uh, orgasms. And <laughs> when you say later in life, how later in life? Uh, she, she was in her 60s. My, my parents uh, were together for 72 years. That is one hell of a run. That was. And they were inseparable. And I didn't realize how good I had it. I was angry at them because they didn't ski. You know, I thought I was with the wrong family. But, uh, for instance, my father was uh, a prisoner of war during World War II. And being Jewish, when he got into the prisoner of war camp, they were going to kill him, except that he was the company interpreter and they needed him. He was missing in action for six months. He came back. He had PTSD. My parents moved around the country because my dad couldn't settle down, and then he did. He also, uh, later in life, Um, He was working for my father in a family business. We had women's wear stores in Grand Central Station. And my grandfather was a very controlling man. And eventually my father said, I'm not putting up with this, and made a differentiating move. Moved us to Wisconsin, where my mother had family, and started out a new life, and it failed. And the business did not go. Wow. And he had to go back and... He asked his father for that job back and went back to work with him. What was your experience of that as a little kid? Um, I didn't really understand how much my father was eating crow and willing to do what he needed to do to be the man he wanted to be as a father. But he eventually became one of the chief controllers for United Jewish Appeal. He went out, he left that business and became very successful. And what it taught me was about differentiation, that just because you're making a differentiation move doesn't mean you're going to be successful. It doesn't make you closer to God. And sometimes you fall on your face and you got to pick yourself up. And what I saw in my father was uh, a man who believed in doing the right thing. That's what he taught me to do. And uh, he taught me to live my beliefs, and he lived his, and that's what I watched. And... I didn't realize how great a family I had because my father wasn't famous. He didn't write a book. He wasn't well-known. But what he was was just like my mother, two decent people that paid their taxes. They wanted to do the right thing. And I think that's what makes any country, including America, great. It's not the people who get their 15 minutes of fame like most kids want to have now. It's people who simply are willing to lead humble lives, do the right thing, kiss their kids, and be good parents, and that's what my parents did, and I am undyingly grateful to them. As I've been doing these interviews and I ask people about their family of origin, you'd be surprised to know how many of the the famous therapists, family of origin, really did not know about their impact on the field or their work or even read their books. What did your parents, since they were around and had longevity, what did they think of your career? That was different. That's, boy, Eli, you have put your finger on something. I was at a meeting uh, a number of years ago with 
all the heads of the sex therapy field, okay? It was a huge table, and everybody's telling their stories. I was the only one whose parents were proud. In fact, my dad would get uh, uh, points by telling his friends that he taught me everything about sex I knew. <laughs> they were, they were, they they got it. They were, they were proud. They were very proud. My my dissertation was on the uh, uh, living room table. You know, constructing the crucible was there. My dad said he tried reading a part of it once. You know, he got sort of through it, although constructing the crucible is tough. Uh, my, my parents were uh, proud as punch. And in fact, when they were in nursing home, uh, my father's name was Stan, my mother's name was Rose, and they would refer to them as one name. It would be Stan Rose, because you never saw one without the other. And Anything that I have developed in terms of therapy, that came from my clients. I was completely unprepared for what I saw going on with my clients, particularly the really bad ones. And I had no idea how bad people could be because of my parents. And then when I really started to learn what a lot of people do have as parents, I realized how good it was. And by the way, I mentioned I just came back from a training program both here and in uh, Germany. It is amazing to me how many therapists come out of absolutely terrible homes. In fact, that's why they picked the profession. But they've never dealt with it. That's one of the problems, and it controls the field because the blind spots that the rank-and-file therapists have to their own family coincide with the major therapies that are being done today. That's why it's hard to move the field forward because the blind spots that many people have also line up with the blind spots in the approaches. That's what makes the approaches popular. All right, so you're leading into, yes, the, the next question is, how do, we move the full, how do we move the field forward? How do we integrate uh, these disciplines of sex therapy and MFT uh, and w what is the next kind of piece of that uh, as far as your work? It's, I don't think it's going to come from either field. I think it's going to come from outside the field. Um, I read outside the field. If you were going to ask me, who are my heroes? Okay, yeah, I want to know who's your biggest influences. Uh, well, there was Bill Masters. Okay, There was Marie Bowen. But uh, I think that if you just read within the field, I think it's important to read the journals, but if you just read the journals, all you're going to be reading is what Thomas Kuhn called normal science. You're going to find cuter and cuter approaches to prove what we already believe. And it's very, very hard to innovate if you just stay inside the field. You would have never gotten to your uh, neurobiological component of the evolution of your model if you would have just stayed in the field. Absolutely. So to me, the heroes are outside the field who don't buy our biases. All right, so who should we be looking at outside of the field? And who are the people outside of the field that inspire you, uh, that you look towards? Oh, you, you ought to take a look at the work of Craig Budd, who is a guy who spent his whole life looking at the right in, interior, interior insula. Uh, this is a neurobiologist who, when people stop just looking at the amygdala, where MFTs, you know, they're into amygdala. Uh, this guy's looking at a completely different part of the brain and really helped move things forward, including when we started studying our treatment failures and realized that most of the parents of treatment failures are doing disgusting things. The first book was published by APA about five years ago saying, we don't know anything about this. Disgust is one of the five, uh, one of the seven primary emotions. It's an automatic reaction. Parents do things that are bad enough; it triggers disgust reactions involuntarily in kids' heads. And when you have repeated disgust reactions, you have traumatic mind mapping, and it affects your interior insula, and then it starts affecting how your brain works. And this is relatively common; it doesn't take that much. So somebody did a study, and they looked at how many bad experiences does a parent have to have before their kid starts looking wacko. It's five. So 35% of a random sample, uh, the parents had five or more uh, traumatic experiences growing up, and their children were demonstrably already showing symptoms of maladjustment. 
So being able to get outside the field to see something completely new. So for instance, now I present on antisocial empathy. And you would think that I had set the Bible on fire because most people think it, uh, uh, empathy is always pro-social, but the neurobiologists know it's not. So the neurobiologists... For some of our listeners that aren't uh, familiar with that term, briefly explain it. Um, empathy is nothing more than the ability to know what somebody else is feeling and thinking. Right. But in the MFT field, empathy has been conflated with compassion. Not outside, but particularly in the United States, that's true. So that's why there's this assumption empathy is always pro-social. That's why when President Trump uh, uh, said, uh, I'm sorry, at the Democratic Convention, there was the parent of the, of the, of the soldier who had died who said somebody needs to teach Trump empathy. The bad news is Trump has empathy. He doesn't have compassion. But he has the ability to know what other people are feeling and thinking because that's what makes him a wheeler dealer. But not in a pro-social way. No, that's correct. And so the whole idea of antisocial empathy sounds like an oxymoron to many therapists. But antisocial empathy is the enjoyment of other people's pain and suffering. When I work in Germany, they have a word for it. It's called schadenfreude. There is no corresponding word in the English language because us English speakers apparently are incapable of schadenfreude. There are many parents who enjoy sandbagging their kids. They enjoy punishing their children. And so in the past, I saw a tape of Murray Bowen saying, parents always do the best that I can. And I was sitting next to Monica McGoldrick, who knew him, and I said, what is this? Is this dogma or is this Murray? And Monica said, it's, it's Murray. Okay. Did you, so I, I take it from that, I have two more questions for you. I, said, I take it that you never got to meet Murray Bowen. You clearly were very close with Bill Masters. What did yeah. Bill Masters think of the evolution of your work? And what do you think Murray Bowen would have thought of what you've done with your crucible model? Well, I can tell you what uh, Bill Masters thought because we traded. Uh, Ruth and I spent a week with Bill and his second wife uh, trading ideas. I wanted to pick his brain. I wanted to know what he really knew, and he wanted to learn about crucible. And when I talked to him about hugging to relaxed, right, Hartman and Fithian had got to, gotten to foot rubs. That's as far as they got. But when I showed him about hugging to relaxed, he said that he wished that he had invented it. So he loved this stuff. He, he was an amazingly open-minded man with a lot of scientific integrity. And so he was just a pleasure to talk to, even when our ideas didn't line up. So that, that was, that was the, uh, the impact of Bill. Uh, Murray, I think, would have been happy about what we, what we talked about. Um, uh, I, I think simply he didn't go into the field of sex because it wasn't his stronghold. Uh, but one of the things that I have been amazed at was that we haven't had to recount a single thing that we've said based on differentiation except one. We've finally found one. Murray said, uh, uh, the, the idea of therapists can't take you farther than they themselves, I absolutely agree with that. But he also said that most people, if they're together for a while, you can assume they're at the same level of differentiation. There's one way that that's not true, and that's where one partner has a serious neurobiological problem. And if one partner has a serious neurobiological problem, they may not be at the same level of differentiation. So one person may actually be better functioning, higher functioning overall in terms of differentiation. But for instance, if they have a block and they can't hold on to uh, who their partner really is. And so every time that this person has an affair, it's like, oh, I didn't realize that you were a person who could have an affair. That's how two people at different levels of differentiation could end up staying together for a while. You take care of the neurobiological problem, things get interesting. Here's one of the other things that I think is very provocative for the field of MFT. Once you understand that things like antisocial empathy occurs in parents, 
once you get rid of the nonsense that parents always do the best that they can, if they do, you won the lottery. But m many parents don't. And lots of parents enjoy sinking their kid. The idea of taking care of older parents when they are at retirement age, that's one of the gospels of MFT. And if you go to Germany, it's not only in, in the zeitgeist, if you don't take care of your parents, the state takes care of them and charges you. So they will bill you for taking care of your parents if you don't. But there are parents whose minds are dangerous to be around. And then what do you do? And what we are finding is that both therapists and clients have to get much more sophisticated, much less idealistic, much more realistic about dealing with highly destructive parents later in life who then expect to be taken care of. And if you're an MFT, you sort of push the client to take care of that parent. The idea of maybe that's not a wise thing to do. Maybe you take care of the financial responsibilities, you take care of the basic health, but issues about how often you go and visit and things like that, these are excruciating issues for people that have not come up while the idealized image of parents has stayed around. But as we're moving more and more into doing a neurobiological therapy and understanding how parents can, for instance, take a child, an adult child hostage for life by simply creating emotional superglue, which is nothing more than repeatedly doing patently disgusting and hateful things to a child you instill in them this reversal of disgust. The disgust is a survival mechanism just like empathy and just like mind mapping. And the normal disgust reaction is to remove yourself from the offending person or object because it's survival, right? But what happens with disgust reaction when it's done repeatedly is it reverses that process and it glues you to the parent. You're blind to the parent you don't really have a good map of their minds, but you have this just uncontrollable urge to just stick with them no matter what they do. When you start playing with that, if you're an MFT, it starts to challenge a lot of the basic tenets that we hold dear in the field. And I am hopeful that it will continue because it really needs to have legs. This is where I think the next generation of MFT that will be much more complex is going to come from, but it's coming from outside the field, not within the field. Yes, and, and listening to you talk, you are still as vital and as passionate, pardon the pun, <laughs> as, as you've ever been about the field. So this is normally the last question I ask is always, you know, how do you want to be remembered? What do you want your legacy to, to be? But I think for you, it's, it's two questions is what is the next step of your career? And then how do you want to be remembered? The next step of my career is actually underway. Uh, we spent 30 years developing crucible therapy. It's a sex and marital therapy, behavior-based, fits DSM. For the last 15 years behind the scenes, I've been working with high-risk couples and people who really have issues, and we've developed a neurobiological therapy that is completely right brain, not left brain. So, uh, uh, Teaching it is completely different because you don't teach it with slides. Slow like Brain Talk, the book that's out, uh, uh, it has all the science. I'm hopeful that that is really going to open up a whole new way of understanding brain-based therapy that has nothing to do with mindfulness. Right? Yes, you can get a statistically significant change with mindfulness, but when uh, somebody is saying, I'm going to divorce your ass, you can't go in the other room and do mindfulness you've got to be able to stay in the fray and keep up with that. I think what I would like as my legacy is um, that these paradigm-shifting therapies, both crucible therapy and crucible neurobiological therapy, will be recognized as a different reality. That's what I think these approaches really have to offer. Uh, Alan Gurman talked about garbage bag eclecticism where you just take a number of different throw it branches. against the wall and see if it sticks yeah and today i'm virginia satir and tomorrow i'm sal Mnuchin, and i'm never looking at how this doesn't fit so 
when you find a paradigm shifting therapy, it's not eureka. It basically makes you realize, number one, what the hell have you been doing up to now? And number two, it means that you really have to change how you practice. And so that's what happens when you're dealing with a profession that's almost like a guild in terms of skill. All the, the qualifications, all, anything we know to be empirically based therapy is fundamentally tied to the paradigms it comes out of. And when you begin to challenge those paradigms, all of a sudden, that's when therapists go, wait a second, you're messing with my money, you're, how I pay my mortgage, how I identify myself. You're not just teaching me an idea, Dave. You're asking me to sort of challenge everything I've ever believed in how I practice. And the answer is, you're right. And that's not a bad thing. Agreed. And we will end with that. It's been a lot of fun. I have learned a lot. To give me the German word one more time. Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude. That the will be enjoyment my word of, of the other day. people suffering. Right. Well, I have enjoyed this. No suffering involved. And uh, <laughs> I look forward to talking to you again down the line, my friend. It'd Thank be my you very pleasure. much. There you have it. Another thought provoking installment of the AAMFT interview on the podcast. Dr. David Snarch, in his own words, and he is certainly not shy. I learned a lot in that interview. And I'm hoping you did as well. And you can see these model developers, uh, they have a certain common factor. Their passion, their belief in what they do and how they do it is part of the reason that they're effective. We love hearing from you over the first month of the podcast. There's several ways you can do that. Please drop us an email at communications at amft.org. That's communications at aamft.org. Also, follow the conversation on Twitter. The handle is at the AAMFT, hashtag AMFT Podcast. I can't tell you enough how much I really appreciate the supportive comments. Please, um, if you have that iPhone, pull out the podcast button, type in AMFT in the search, hit subscribe, and please leave us a rating and a review. Those really do help. And as I said, inform our content for the show you can also find us wherever you know you find your favorite podcast whether that be spotify stitcher google play coming up next week we are going to tell you about all the innovations in store for the amft throughout 2019 until next time my friends stay systemic